The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. And when Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening, at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. That is the gospel of the Lord. So uh, continuing and along the same lines as I've been uh, beginning uh, my work with you these past Sunday mornings, I'd like again to run through an exercise of uh, Lectio Divina, an ancient monastic spiritual practice and a way of encountering scripture. So uh, I would like to read again, uh, uh, a second time, a verse uh, from the gospel this morning. And if you would, uh, just listen attentively to it. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. So I'm going to read the passage again, and uh, this time I would like for you to be attentive to a word or a phrase uh, that seems to be speaking uh, directly to you a word or a phrase that stands out. Here we go. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. And again, you're just being attentive to a word or a phrase that seems uh, to be speaking directly to you. And uh, we turn now the meditation on the, uh, on, the, on the particular phrase or word into a prayer and ask God, what, what message has God for you in this passage? What message has God for you in this passage? What is this passage speaking to you?
So, after an exercise of reading, meditating, praying, we now enter into a time of contemplation where we uh, look back over the experience and the meeting that it held for us. Again, a final reading. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. So, you know, a lot of times uh, when you go to the movies, uh, you know, they advertise that the movie's going to start at a certain time. And, you know, what actually starts are the previews of coming attractions. And, uh, you know, you might sit there and watch previews for several of the movies that are uh, coming soon to the theater and so forth. And uh, that's always a good way to kind of get settled into the theater and uh, prepared for the movie and all that. And uh, with Mark's gospel, it's not that way. Uh, you're going to sit down and just, you know, get right into the heart of it. He's going to get baptized. There's no infancy narrative, nothing like that. No prologue, no fancy dialogue. He's baptized. He's in the wilderness. He's tempted. He goes to the uh, uh, synagogue last week uh, in uh, Capernaum. Uh, already he's casting out demons. They're astounded at his teaching. And uh, so... Uh, we're getting right into it. We're still in the first chapter of Mark, and we are breathless. I mean, this is a day in the life of Jesus, and he is on the move. Got up early, made it to the synagogue, cast out the demon, very clear about who's boss here, and now he's leaving the synagogue, and he goes to the home of Peter and Andrew, along with James and John. Now, I've been to Capernaum uh, a number of times, and... You know, one of the things about going to the Holy Land, and uh, the guides will always tell you this, is that we're not exactly sure what happened here or where it happened. Perfect example, Last Supper. You know, we know, we think we know about what region in Jerusalem the Last Supper was held, but, you know, it's probably close, but we're not sure. And they, they take you to a room where pilgrims have gone uh, for hundreds of years, uh, probably no more than uh, 12 or 1300, and say, well, this is the cynical, this is where the Last Supper uh, took place. You know, the same is even true of the crucifixion. I mean, they're, they think that they're pretty close, but they're not exactly sure. Anyway, that happens over the Holy Land, that there's some... Uh, uh, there's some confusion, some scholarly debate about where certain events happened and where certain people lived and all that. Well, that is not the case this morning. We know exactly, no scholar would doubt that the synagogue where Jesus spoke in Capernaum, uh, the synagogue that exists today is not the same synagogue, but it sits on the ruins of the exact synagogue where uh, Jesus cast out that first demon, and came before the people with a public message. We are also exactly sure, exactly sure where Peter's home was. It's within a minute's walk. You can actually just walk right down the, uh, right down the thoroughfare that existed in the first century uh, to Peter's home. It's spine-tingling, actually. And uh, the home of Peter uh, has been, actually, there's a, a basilica above it, uh, to preserve the site itself. And in the floor of the church that sits above the house, you can, it, there's a glass floor. You can actually look down into uh, the home of Peter. And so this is an actual place, and this is an actual town. And it just brings the historicity of it uh, kind of alive. But it was a short distance away, and uh, they go in, they go into the house, and uh, this is an important moment now. Jesus has made a public appearance, uh, cast out a demon, and, you know, after that, in the afterglow of that experience, they're returning now uh, to Peter's home. No idea if Jesus had been there before, probably, but uh, they have a bit of an entourage, Simon, Andrew, the two brothers, and uh, 
the Zebedee boys, uh, James and John, and they go in. And it turns out that Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a fever. And, uh, and the, as uh, Mark uh, tells the story, uh, they told him that at once. And, you know, Mark is very clear. They told him that at once. Now, why would they tell him that? Uh, number one, because on the Sabbath, he probably didn't want to hang around anybody that had a fever. I mean, you know, uh, we are people right now that are unusually aware of unclean, the concept of unclean and not being near or around people that we're suspicious of what influence they might have on them. You know, I, I don't think, I can't remember a time in my life uh, that I've wondered about, I wonder if they've got it. You know, I know they're sheltering, I know they're intelligent, I know they have masks on, I know they probably wash their hands and are careful. They may even have had their first vaccination shot, but they might have it. And they can have it and not know it, and they might give it to me and not even know, and I could get sick and maybe even die. And I'm suspicious about that with everybody that I come in contact with. I mean, you just don't know. And so you're suspicious and aware. And they went and told Jesus, they went, you know, here we are on the Sabbath, and you need to know that, you know, Simon's uh, mother-in-law is down with, with a fever, and you might not want to come in. Well, that doesn't appear to be a boundary uh, that Jesus is interested in observing. And he goes into where she is. You know, it's interesting about this mother-in-law thing. And, uh, you know, we don't know much about the author of Mark. Uh, we, know, we know about the time frame, you know, maybe as early as 60 AD, which would have been, you know, a full 30 or more years after the resurrection. But the one thing that scholars say for sure is that Mark had a personal knowledge and was in the personal presence of the, the, those who had been eyewitnesses, and specifically Peter. Paul, in his, in his letters, on several occasions, mentions the relationship between Peter and Mark. And so perhaps this story made its way uh, prominently into Mark's gospel because it was a story that Peter told often. You know, my imagination goes crazy at these. You know, okay, Peter's got a mother-in-law. Well, what does that mean? It, mean? it means, for one thing, that Peter was married and that his mother-in-law was in residence in his house. And, you know, what does that mean? And why does she have a fever? You know, I mean, you could speculate about this. You know, here's the deal. Uh, Peter's married uh, to this woman. They're probably, you know, I don't know, maybe in their early 20s. I don't know. And the mother-in-law is living with them for whatever reason. Maybe her husband has died. Nobody knows. But, you know, in Roman Catholic circles where the celibacy of the priesthood is so strictly observed, you know, you can imagine that a Catholic priest would say, uh, Peter was married? Really? He could do that and we can't? I mean, you know, it raises some interesting questions. But uh, the way I look at it, is that, um, you know, she was a widow, and um, she is living with uh, her daughter and her husband, Peter, who's a fisherman, got a good living. And, uh, you know, they're doing okay, but she's really dependent on them. Now, one of the things that's been happening to Peter recently has been he has been behaving very strangely. Going down, you know, visiting this baptizer in the wilderness, and now there's this itinerant preacher that Peter seems to be behaving very differently around, and rumors of following, and maybe not doing any more fishing, and like that, and uh, all this confusion, and she, as she is so vulnerable that this has put her to bed, and she's got a fever, and she is bedridden. Now, you know, the way I imagine first the century Palestinians, uh, were they, they were pretty tough. And, you know, it would take something, it would take something uh, to put uh, one of those women down, bedridden. Just my speculation, but there she is. And now uh, you have to imagine how tender this scene is. Because it mentions nothing of a conversation, Nothing of what's wrong, where does it hurt, how have you been, like that. It just says that he took her by the hand 
And, you know, a more accurate translation of it, rather than lifted her up, was he raised her up. And the verb that's used here is the same verb that will be used when Jesus is raised from the dead at the very end of the gospel. He raises her up. Now, you know, you can talk about healing and healing power, but uh, I think all of us ha have experienced at one time or one moment in our lives the power of touch. He took her hand. He touched her. She was unclean. She was sick with fever in bed, really sick. Who knows with what? He took her hand and lifted her up. You know, one of the, one of the scenes that I, that I always enjoy, and we'll be watching a little bit of this later on today in the football game, is that, uh, you know, have, you have these enormous linemen. I mean, these men are huge, 6'5", in excess of 300 pounds, and they are huge. And it'll be a little running back, you know, and th these guys aren't tiny either, but there will be a run little running back, and he'll scamper down there, and they'll all, you know, gang up on him and knock him down. And then one of those big linemen will roll over there and take the hand of the running back who's on, who's on the ground and just almost pick him up off the ground like he was a fly. And uh, you often wonder the intimacy of the touch between Jesus and that woman. He took her hand and lifted her up. And it said, immediately, Mar Mark's favorite word, immediately, it left her. It's almost as though, uh, again, there's a kind of possession. It referring to the fever. It left her. And so uh, she's experienced then this the miraculous touch of Christ, the miraculous healing power of God to restore uh, humanity to its wholeness. It's a very tender, very graphic, and very dangerous picture of the ministry that will follow. And all of the, all of the healings of Jesus, he never wanted to draw attention to the healing because the healings in themselves were teaching. You know, this is what God does in the incarnation, touches us, touches us to lift us up. And, you know, what we really need to pay attention to now is what happened as a result. And as a result, she got up and she began to serve. And it's important to note, again, the vocabulary is extremely important. The word for serve now is diacono. And this is the same word that we've seen just a few verses earlier in Mark's gospel of what happened when Jesus was uh, fasting in the wilderness and the, angel, and the angels diaconeo to Jesus. They served him. And later on in the 13th chapter of Mark's gospel, Jesus will say very clearly, very clearly, I came not to be served, but to diakoneo, but to serve. And uh, again, the illustration when Jesus washes the feet of the disciples and says, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but I am diakoneo you. I am serving you. And this is an example of what you're to do for each other. Now just reflect for a moment on your life and moments. Just remember times when you've served, when you've done for someone else something that you, out of your gift set, were able to do. Something as small as, you know, lending a nickel to a friend to something large, sacrificing time and energy and resources to do something really important and transforming for someone, some system, some and anything else. And it's because it strikes on the very purpose of our lives, which is uh, to serve. That's why, that's why we're here. We've been loved, we've been raised, and so we serve. And uh, so what you see in the story of this woman in this particular scene is the story of God's relationship to humanity and the response of humanity uh, to a loving and grace-filled God who reaches out to us, touches us, takes our hand, lifts us up, and a as a response to that graceful touch, uh, we are called to a life of service. You know, it's interesting, I, I talked uh, last week in considering uh, 
the, the demon-possessed man. You know, I talked about possession and addiction. I talked about the 12 steps and the importance of admitting that your life is out of control and unmanageable. And, uh, you know, you can call it a fever. Uh, you can call it a state of sin and brokenness. You can just call it plain old human vulnerability. But we're all terrified. We're all living in a planet, and the seams of it are just coming apart, uh, you know, a stitch at a time, all the time. And so, you know, we may not be down with fever, but we, we all have it. It may be low grade, you know, it, 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 may, it may be visible, and it may actually be putting, putting you down, but, you know, we're all in a very precarious position. And uh, it's into something just exactly like this, the circumstance like this, where Jesus crosses the boundary and, uh, of convention and comes to us. You know, in my resources for uh, preparation, I, I found an interesting story about an author, a fellow whose name is um, John Mortimer. And uh, John Mortimer was an English barrister, an English lawyer, and an author and a playwright. And he actually wrote the, uh, the stories that were filmed in the BBC uh, television series, Rumpel uh, of the Bailey. And uh, it, it, great uh, TV series, by the way, of a lawyer who takes on cases primarily of the, um, the underdog. But uh, he wrote an autobiography, uh, John Mortimer did, called um, Clinging to the Wreckage. And it actually came out of an experience that he had talking to a friend of his who was a very avid yachtsman and was very fond of sailing, uh, primarily in the English Channel. And um, they were having lunch one day, and, and Mortimer asked this fellow, he said, uh, you know, I understand that it's uh, quite dangerous, isn't it, to uh, sail on the English Channel, that uh, the waters can be uh, treacherous? And uh, the old yachtsman looked at him and said, you know, uh, it is dangerous, but it can be okay as long as you don't learn how to swim. It can be okay as long as you don't learn how to swim. And uh, this intrigued uh, Mortimer, as it probably does you, and he said, uh, not learn how to swim? What do you mean by that? He said, well, you know, quite often uh, when a ship uh, capsizes in the English Channel, uh, you can usually see the shore on either side. And the temptation, if you know how to swim, is to try to make it. And invariably, invariably, those who survive a, cap a capsizing and try to swim their way to shore will never make it. If, however, you cling to the wreckage, and are patient, a helicopter inevitably will come and rescue you. I've had it happen on several occasions. And so it's best always uh, to cling uh, to the wreckage. And so, you know, here we are in our vulnerable lives and a little bit scared and not quite sure where it's all going to go or what it all means. And uh, we're clinging to to the wreckage, and uh, Jesus comes to us, doesn't he? And he takes our hand, and he lifts us up, and the fever leaves. And we get up and we serve. Amen. Contributions to St. Luke's Episcopal Church help to make the digital ministry and other outreach within the community possible. If it is in your heart to make a donation, St. Luke's secure PayPal link, as well as the church's mailing information, may be found in the description of this video. Thank you.